So JC, once again, are you confirming today that you want to be baptized, that you want to become a member of the Worthington Seventh-day Adventist Church, and to leave your, live your life for Jesus? Yes. Amen. 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 Then I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. great opportunity. There are people who have studied enough, that know enough, that know what they're doing, they just haven't done it. And so it's okay. You know, we should be a family enough to be able to stand up and say, you know what, that's, that's, that's what I want to do. So remember that. You see that, that's inspiration. And my boys and my family like their family a lot. We'll miss them. But we've told them that we're coming to see them and stay for as long as we can. And uh, appreciate, appreciate that over there. And we have prayer today, and I'm going to invite a special guest to pray. And he's like, oh, no, don't do that. Do you, th do you think he's saying that right now? Yeah, he's saying it. But before, he doesn't know all the, the, the stuff that we pray for because he has his own church. And so I'm going to ask my friend, uh, Elder Don Byard, who is a pastor. He's with Julian and I, friend. If you come up here, my brother, I'll, I'll give the requests and things like that, and you can just bless us. We really appreciate you. Julian and I appreciate you. That you would come over here, you're at Bell Fountain, Piqua, and what's the other church? Lima. Anybody ever been to, how many of you know this young man? Could you raise your hands? Well, see, they need to know you, okay? We appreciate it. His brother and I went to Walla Walla College, and his brother is just a little better looking than you are, but not much, okay? <laughs> but I'll call him and tell him that. <laughs> but we appreciate it. He's always loving and kind. You only, yeah, say something about this brother here. I just wanted to say that uh, he has... Uh, been the pastor of Kayleen and uh, Beth Vance. So we thank you for the gift you gave us in that. You, you did a good job. We still hold that against oh, us. Yes. <laughs> He's holding that against us. See, they, they, we got a good thing with him. But in, in our church, uh, there's we do believe in, in, in high church, meaning we love a lot. And so the higher we go, the more love we have. And uh, both of us uh, really, really stress it. And before you pray today, I'd like to say, Thank you for visiting people. Someone asked me the other day, so how's so-and-so doing? And I said, if I tell you, are you going to go visit him? <laughs> and that's not very funny. So I said, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so when we think about it today, it's easy, it's easy to do rules, but it's hard to love people that are, that are hard to love. It's just, it's just that way. But if you really get into it, you'll be able to do it. Uh, one of the things I see Mary Lemming here, Thank you for bringing Mary today, Muncie. Mary, we love you so much. It's just when you're here, life is a lot better. And you know, when you look around and see people that can't come a lot, when you get to come to church, it's exciting. So if, if any of you feel so called to pick up someone and remove, uh, get, remove that, that scariness in, in yourself and just say, I'm going to step up, there's always someone to pick up and, and help for church. Side. One other thing is we, uh, we do a lot of things and we forget a lot of things. But the one thing we never want to forget is to be, first and foremost, open to the God Spirit. So when you pray for us, may you pray that our church, as I know you do for years, will be open as they sit and they watch and they take it in. And that all, that they'll fit in somewhere in the church. Thank you, Elder, Elder Byard, very much for being here today. Let's kneel for prayer today. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we have been through another week. This is the end of another month. You have graciously been close to us. You have blessed us. You have guided us through the difficulties that we have faced. We come here today putting everything aside to give you praise and to express our love and appreciation for what you have done for us. We thank you for the opportunity that you give to us each day to love those about us and to show them a little bit of your grace and mercy. 
We pray in a special way today during this service that your spirit will be especially present, not only to move us to appreciate your word more, but also to incorporate it into our life, that we might truly be the instrument of God reaching out to those around us so that you might receive the glory and the praise and the honor that is due your name and that lost souls may find their way to you and that they in turn might also show that love to others. We appreciate the leadership you've given to this church and we ask that you will bless them as they reach out into this community and as they uh, train disciples for you. We are thankful for this baptism that we saw today and we just pray that the influence of this young man will be great for your kingdom. We thank you and we praise you as we open your word and open our hearts to your spirit. For we ask it all and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Amen. Now, a little formality because I forget sometimes that there are two services here. One and two. I know everybody as one because Eulene and I are here for both of them. Some people only know people from one service. They don't know the other. So there's two things going on, but there's one church. We are only privileged usually to have Brother Bradley in second, but his guy gets up and helps the entire church, both services. And uh, I would like for you to, as you come up here, Brother Bradley, to call for the offering. I'd like for you to introduce, again, your wife, because she definitely is the better looking part of your family. And uh, you lean to amen that too, Brother Bob. And I'd like you to know people on a personal level. This man loves not only the Lord, as we know, but he loves people. We enjoy his humor, but enjoy his strength, his purpose, and most of all, his drive. This guy has tremendous drive forward. And the church would not be where it's at without you and your wife. So thank you. And if you'd introduce your wife again, I would appreciate it. I want to hear, I like the way you talk to her. It, it reminds me of some other good guys. Julie, my darling, my love. <laughs> <laughs> the sweetest thing <clears throat> that's ever happened to me in this life. Would you stand up, please? <laughs> Julie. <laughs> <laughs> and... <clears throat> I want you to know that my wife is a practicing nurse practitioner and she practices quite a bit some days. And <laughs> of course, um, we both are in the medical profession and I was telling somebody, I had a patient that was awakening yesterday and I was taking off her EKG pads and she said that I was stealing her wallet. <laughs> so I won't go into the whole story, but you know, I quit stealing wallets and purses a long time ago, okay? So I'm happy to be here. We're both very happy to be a part of the church. And I want you to know that that song that I promised I was going to teach you, it's on up there. I'm not going to use it this morning because there's three little verses. But the next time I'm up here, God willing, I'm going to teach it to you guys because I promise. But I was thinking as I was watching, um, and the deacons can come forward, please. I was thinking as I was watching one of the, the things on the History Channel about the Second World War, how blessed we really are. And having been in during Vietnam, and I had a brother in during Korea, and my oldest brother was detached with the Tuskegee Airmen, and he's in his 90s right now, but to think there were 70 million people in all that were killed one way or the other during the Second World War. And I think of how blessed we are because of these people that went on ahead of us. And I think of the story of the old man that was going to, into France and they were hassling him about his passport. He said, well, the last time I was here, I didn't need a passport because he was on the beaches. But we are a blessed people. And this is my first year of going to a constituency meeting. And I think of all the monies that come in from all of you guys out there and the things that come to our church as I see in finance committee meeting and then there's still some people who would really not they don't feel it's the right thing to give to our church because 
they don't think maybe the program is going in the right way. Well, I'm here to tell you, when I pay my tithe and offering, it goes to the Lord. And after that, wherever it goes, the Lord will take care of it. Because you remember the story of the widow's mite? You know how much a mite is, anybody? How much? Raise your hand. Let me hear somebody. Anybody? Well, it's two and a half cents. Now, if the Lord, with his being the economist he is, can take that and let it go, you know what he can do for us. So keep that in mind, is how blessed you are. And let's get closer together as we look for the Lord to come. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord, thank you so much for the blessing that you give us, for the many, many things that we see from day to day, the beautiful weather, the opportunities that we have to serve you. Lord, every day is a new day, and we take it for granted, and we need to stop and count our blessings. Bless this offering today. Bless those who give and those who cannot. Bless all that are among us who are sick and afflicted. Keep us all in your care, and Lord, we ask that you finish up the work and come and take us home soon. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Love. 
love for us How vast beyond all measure That he would give his only son To make a wretch his treasure Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer But this I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom back to back here. <laughs> so, oh, church family. I'm so excited. Um, I've had a really good few weeks. I just want to share with you. Um, the other day I put the wrong gas in my weed eater. I didn't Don't tell Paul. <laughs> I didn't tell Paul. <laughs> and I got to thinking, I put the wrong gas in my weed eater and it didn't work. And I thought, oh no, my neighbor comes over and he says, are you okay? And I, I'm trying to get my, my weed eater started. And I couldn't get my weed eater started. And I, I said, yeah, I think I'm okay. Um, while I was at the gas pump, I just happened to put the wrong gas in my weed eater gas tank. I put premium in it instead of the regular, regular unleaded and so it doesn't work anymore and uh, I got <laughs> sorry <laughs> another $250 <laughs> um, anyway I got to thinking about that we got to put the right gas in our weed eaters don't we because there's so much that we need to give everyone here and we have that ability if we put the right gas in ourselves the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit wants to work through each one of you and he's going to just remember the Lord has a record of all the things that are going on down here all the moments that you spend all the things that you do he keeps a record let's make sure that record says pardoned I'm done preaching. Oh, I wanted to thank Clarence. We asked him at the last minute. And Bill. And Bill. <laughs> what a wonderful, beautiful picture I have of a place without sorrow. My days are all numbered down here. My Lord keeps a record of the moments I'm living down here. He knows all about me, all my troubles.
I will walk on the streets of that city of gold. I will bask in that heavenly light. I will look on the face of my Savior so dear in that city that cometh no night. My Lord keeps a record of the moments I'm living down here. He knows all about me, how my troubles, my sorrows, Thank you very much, uh, Carol and Paul, Clarence and Bill. That was beautiful. Glad that uh, you didn't step down right away when I tried to get up here on the stage. Uh, before I begin with my sermon, I just want to uh, let you know that we missed uh, to congratulate our birthday kids. Some of, some of you have birthdays today, and I know for sure that Joanne Gerabrand, I, I, I cannot see where she's seated, Okay, congratulations and happy birthday. And if there is anyone else who has a birthday today, we are so happy that God brought you in this world and also in our family. With no further ado, I would like to let you know for those of you who have uh, not been here with us, uh, from the beginning of uh, my sermon series, we are almost uh, nearing to the end of this sermon series and I've titled this one a new look into the passion of Christ. And before we begin with uh, the new topic for today, I would like us all to tune up for the topic. So would you please watch the video? You're gonna see probably some of your stories. Let's gain, gain some inspiration before we start with the Word of God. Without you, I feel 
some of you are coming here today and probably by looking at this video you saw your story. Some of you are coming here and you say, I'm wounded all over. And today I would like to let you know that you have come to the right place. Because today I would like to invite you to climb the most important mountain peak in human history. Today I would like to invite you to climb together with me the spiritual Everest of human history. The place where the grace of God is revealed like no other place in the world. Calvary provides for all of us a vantage point to look at humanity and at our brokenness like no other place in the world. Actually, I will claim that without Calvary, not just humanity, but the universe will not have the right picture of who God is. Today I would like to invite you to take a look at yourself, at your brokenness, at your wounds, and to discover with me the secret of the power of transforming grace that streams from Calvary. Just one secret. The grace of God revealed on Calvary encompasses so many things that it will take us eternity to grasp it. But today, let's look at just one secret that has the power to transform every single human being and every life, no matter how broken and how distorted. Would you please uh, join me with, uh, when I open my Bible to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. And today I've titled the sermon, the title of this message of hope, The Power of the Passion of Christ. So let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, verses 38 through 30, uh, 33 through 38. Luke 23, verses 33 through 38. And I have a helpful deacon. If you would like to read for us, please lift up your hand. We are well advanced in time. I don't want the Holy Spirit to leave us. I know when you get hungry, the Holy Spirit leaves us. So please, let's hear the word of God. Let's hear the power of the gospel. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And the people stood looking on, but even the rulers with them sneered, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him sour wine, and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. An inscription also was written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Thank you, Phil. Who were the first group of people who gathered to mock Jesus? Did you notice? The first group of people who gathered on Calvary to mock Jesus were religious people. They were keeping the Sabbath. They were warming the pews in the synagogues every single Sabbath. And they were worshiping the one that they were about to crucify. Crucifixion was bitterly painful and awfully shameful. Yet the religious people the Seventh-day Adventists of 31 AD were not pleased just with the physical pain and the shame that Jesus was exposed to. They wanted to break him. They wanted to, to hurt him as much as possible. So to the shame and to the physical pain, they added ridicule. 
And I would like to let you know something. We people very seldom radical and try to hurt, extra hurt people unless they have hurt us first. How did Jesus hurt the religious people of his time? How did he hurt the Adventists of his time? Well, Jesus underdelivered. Jesus broke the expectations of the Seventh-day Adventists back then. They were unimpressed with Jesus. Jesus claimed to be the king of Israel. Yet they were wondering, what kind of king is that? First, he does not have a palace. He was homeless. Then, he didn't have any money. He was broke. And from their perspective, Jesus looked pretty much helpless. Jesus has, broke, has broken the dreams of the Jewish nation, of a Messiah who is going to be powerful, of a Messiah who is going to be a king and have on his disposal all the power to do what they ask him to. The people of God expected much more of Jesus, and Jesus underdelivered. And I would like to ask you before we delve with the issues of back then, to ask you a question. Are you also unimpressed with Jesus? Did Jesus in some point of your life underdelivered? Did you ask God to do something in your life and he didn't? Did you plead with him to answer a prayer and he refused to? Do you ask him to prevent the foreclosure of, of your home and he allowed it? Is your Jesus also under delivering? Are you disappointed with him? Because if you are, welcome to the crowd of Calvary, who was not just pleased with the physical pain that crucifixion brought, who was not just pleased with the shame that, cru that the crucifixion brought. They wanted to break Jesus with their radical. Some of you today are in the position of uh, the religious people and the priests who were bitterly disappointed with Jesus. On Calvary, grace was reigning. On Calvary was standing the one for whom the Jewish nation was waiting for 1,500 years. On Calvary was the one whom they worshipped every single Sabbath in their synagogues. And yet, when he was there, they didn't recognize him. What about you? But there was a second group of people who was also bent to scorn and to make fun of Jesus. And these were the Roman soldiers. These people were not religious. Luke 23 verse 36 says, the soldiers also mocked him, coming and offering him vinegar. Some translations say sour wine. The Greek word oxos means vinegar. And it's very specific. Now, before I begin uh, to explain this a little bit, I would like to make an interesting comment related to the Greek language. The Greek text makes a distinction between the scoffing and the mocking of the soldiers and the mocking of the religious people. The Greek text tells us that the religious people mocked Jesus much more intensely, much more viciously. The grammatical form that is used for the soldiers is that they, they made it just once or twice. The religious people kept on mocking Jesus till the last moment. And I would like here to ask a question. The soldiers mocked Jesus by offering him vinegar. How is offering someone a vinegar mocking? As a matter of fact, this is strange, this is weird, you're going to learn something about me. When I was a teenager or uh, maybe 12-ish, I, I, li I liked vinegar. I liked the taste, the taste of vinegar, especially during the summer. And one day, I overdid it. 
Yeah, in the, in the south, yeah. I overdid it. And I messed up my stomach for three months. I was on a special diet. Anyways, I was always asking myself, how is giving someone vinegar mocking? I love vinegar. Do you know how? In John 19, we read, now a vessel full of vinegar was sitting there with the soldiers. And they filled a sponge with vinegar, put it on a hyssop, this is a stick, and put it to his mouth. How many soldiers today you know who are walking around uh, carrying a jar of vinegar? Oh, and, and carrying also a, a sponge with them, and also a stick. How many soldiers? No. Uh, why do they need this vinegar, the sponge, and the stick? What do they need them for? And how does this relate to mocking Jesus? What you have here on this picture is a public bathroom, Roman public bathroom from Ephesus. And Romans back then, they didn't have toilet paper. When they went to the bathroom, the bathroom has two holes. Here you do the, what you know you have to do in the bathroom. But do you, do you see this one? Here, water was running, and you take a sponge on a stick, and you wash in this running water, the sponge, and then through this hole, you clean yourself. This was the toilet paper. Now these soldiers are coming to Jesus, and they are carrying everywhere with themselves this uh, sponge, the stick, and the vinegar, because Romans discovered cleaning the sponge just in the normal water, because in the public ba bathrooms they use the same sponge to clean everybody, uh, they discovered the diseases spread. So in order to not uh, spread diseases, they not just washed the sponge in water, but also put it in vinegar. So this is why Roman soldiers, when they went everywhere, they had a vessel full of vinegar so that they can clean their toilet paper. What the Roman soldiers did, they took their toilet paper, used toilet paper, and shoved it in the mouth of God. But the mocking of Jesus on that day was not over. There was a third group of mockers. Mark chapter 15 tells us, with him, with Jesus, they also crucified two criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. And Matthew says, in the same way, the criminals... What does that mean? The criminals who were crucified with him also heaped insult on Jesus. And to let you know a little bit about the background of the criminals, some of our translations totally unwarranted uh, translate thieves. These guys were not thieves. The Gospel tells us a man, a man called Bar Barabbas was in prison with his fellow insurrectionists. They had committed th thievery. They have committed what? Murder in the rebellion. Theft was not a capital punishment in the Roman Empire. Only murder and rebellion against the Roman authority was punishable by, uh, by crucifixion. So the two people who were mocking Jesus were what kind of guys? Murderers. And they were friends of who? Who was hanging on the middle cross where Barabbas was supposed to hang? And do you know something interesting about Barabbas? The name Barabbas is actually not his first name. This is his surname. This is his family name. Barabbas means son of the father. And do you know what was the first name of Barabbas? In the Gospel of uh, Matthew, there are several manuscripts where it says, Jesus Barabbas. His first name was Jesus. 
And as a matter of fact, this is why Pilate asks three times, confused, uh, which one do you want me to release? Jesus, the Son of God, the King of the Jews, or Jesus Barabbas? Several manuscripts of, of the Greek te text in Matthew read Jesus Barabbas. So, here on the middle cross, instead of Jesus Barabbas, is hanging Jesus, the Son of the Heavenly Father. Instead of Jesus, the Son of the Earthly Father, it was Jesus, the true Messiah, the true Son of the Father. Why are these criminals mocking Jesus? Of all the people on Calvary, these two should understand the pain and the shame of Jesus the most. They should have been the, the last ones to ever consider mocking Jesus. Why are they mocking him? You remember? We mock people, intentionally mock people, especially viciously mock people. And the Greek text reveals that they were repeating these insults over and over and over again the same way as the Jewish religious people were doing it. Why are they mad at Jesus? Do you know why? I told you that they were friends of Barabbas. And they were insurrectionists. They were, rebell they were uh, rebelling against the Roman authority. That means Barabbas, who was the chief of these people, as a, re a re rebel, he presented himself as a messiah. And he gained following. People who believe that he's a messiah, who, people who believe that he's going to give them freedom from the oppression of uh, the Romans and give them new life. And they lost both their freedom and their lives to Jesus Barabbas. And now there is another Jesus hanging on the middle cross. And they project on him all their hate and disappointment, all the things that Barabbas disappointed them with. And they see in Jesus another imposter. And since Barabbas is not in their reach, since Barabbas is not there to keep on him the insult of the disappointments they are going through, they load all their bitterness on Jesus. Now, what about Jesus? How did he respond to this barrage of hatred and radical? What did Jesus do? Do you know what he did? Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. When the Roman soldier hit the hammer and the nail went through the body of Jesus, and the first drops of blood splashed the hammer, Jesus uttered the first word on Mount Calvary, on this spiritual Everest. Father, forgive them. The first thing that Jesus did on Calvary is to offer a prayer. But this was not a prayer for himself. This was a prayer for those religious people like you and me who did not appreciate him. For those secular people like the Romans who are absolutely ignorant about him and for those people who deserve to be crucified like the criminals. The first prayer that Jesus offered on Calvary was a prayer for forgiveness and restoration. Jesus, Jesus did not pray for justice. Jesus prayed for mercy, not on himself, but on people like you and me. Jesus was praying for forgiveness of the unforgivable, crucifying the altar of life. But you know that our translation is uh, not correct. You can go ahead and scratch it in your Bible because it's not correct and gives you a wrong impression. The literally in Greek, it's, it does not say that Jesus said. In Greek it says, then Jesus kept 
on saying, kept on repeating the same thing over and over and over and over again. Father, forgive them. When, when the, the, the Roman soldiers came and nailed him to the cross, and when the pain of the, of the nail was sending a jolt of excruciating suffering through his whole body, Jesus, instead of sending curses, he said, Father, forgive them. When the Roman soldiers lifted up the cross and put it in place and jerked his whole body and another jolt of pain ran through his, uh, through his uh, uh, hands and feet, Jesus prayed again, Father, forgive them. And when the Roman soldiers were gambling for the only earthly possession of Jesus, Jesus was praying, Father, forgive them. And when the Jewish authorities, the people of God, the pew warmers and the Sabbath keepers were crucifying the one that they were worshiping, Jesus was praying, Father, forgive them, for they have no idea what they are doing. And when the soldiers shoved this used toilet paper in the mouth of Christ, He did not curse them. He prayed for them, Father, forgive them. Jesus' first act on the cross was to preach forgiveness. And this reveals something about the nature of God that many religions and many Christians even miss. The first message that the Gospel of Christ preaches from the Mount Everest, from the spiritual Mount Everest, of God's love is forgiveness. Forgiveness for, for those who do not deserve it. Forgiveness for even those who are absolutely not deserving to take another breath. Like people who have committed murder and people of spiritual authority who rejected God himself. But you know what? On Calvary, Jesus was not praying for forgiveness. He was making excuses for the people under the cross. And when you come to your brothers and sisters and you make accusations, whose spirit do you represent? Because even when people deserved accusations, Jesus made excuses for their mistakes. Now, I would like to take you to another part of this story. Because in the midst of this barrage of disbelief, of this barrage of uh, mockery, something extraordinary happened on Calvary. I would like uh, someone to read for us verses 39 through 43. Bill, thank you very much. Lift up your hand again. So let's hear the word of God, verses 39 through 43, let's hear what the power of forgiveness did on Calvary that day. Then one of the criminals who were charged hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. Thank you, Bill. And thank you for placing the comma in the right place. Uh, <clears throat> Do you pay attention to what this criminal is asking? And this is one of the criminals who just a few minutes ago was blaspheming Jesus as well. The first thing that he says, Lord, remember me if you come in your kingdom. Do you know that what this man is doing is amazing? This spiritual insight that he suddenly gains is unbelievable. While the priests 
who had the Bible, who were versed in the Bible to death, did not recognize the King of Glory, while even the disciples who walked with Jesus for three and a half years doubt at this moment that Jesus is really divine. A Jewish criminal who probably never, never read the Bible through and through in his life, believes that the helpless Galilean carpenter beaten to a pulp is no one else but the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Many people were willing to pronounce Jesus King and to believe in Him when He was doing miracles in their lives, when, they were heal when He was healing their cancers, when He was giving them a way out of the foreclosure of their homes, when He was feeding them fishes and bread, and life was working fine. When Jesus was working fine, they also believed in Him. But when He was nailed on the cross, there was only one person of this multitude that recognized in this beaten to a pulp person, no one else but the divinity of Him. And I'm telling you, this is a faith that, transpa uh, uh, that goes beyond imagination. And you have to ask yourself, I have to ask myself, what happened there? Because just a few minutes ago, this criminal was cursing Jesus and was heaping insult on him as well. What caused this transformation? Do you know, friends, forgiveness has an extraordinary power. Forgiveness is stronger than a dynamite. Forgiveness can transform even the most hardened criminal into a son of God. And while this criminal was heaping insult, he was also observing the behavior of Christ. While the soldiers were shoveling uh, toilet paper in the mouth of Jesus, he was noticing that Jesus was not cursing back, but praying, Father, forgive them. And suddenly, when he was listening to that, his heart and mind was, were transformed. Because Jesus forgave, the tongues of this criminal turned into a testimony. Friends, forgiveness has a tremendous power. But when you gain forgiveness, you have to also give forgiveness. Up to this moment, this criminal was bitterly disappointed in Barabbas, in his friend and false messiah. Now he has let go of that. And his eyes are not fixed on the pain and the disappointment. His eyes are fixed on Jesus. And his eyes are opened to recognize who this helpless, seemingly beaten up person really is. Because Jesus surrendered his right to hurt and to judge. And because Jesus forgave. A miracle happened. The first miracle in salvation history happened on Calvary. Friends, forgiveness is surrendering your right to hurt those who hurt, it, hurt you. Forgiveness is surrendering the right to hurt them back for what they did to you. And because Jesus surrendered the right to hurt back, a marvelous transformation happened in the heart of one who decided to look carefully and to see his life and human history from the vantage point view of Calvary. Friends, on Calvary, there were how many crosses? Three crosses. Calvary is a spiritual Everest, a place from which you can see God as clearly as no other place in human history can provide. Yet, there were many people standing on Calvary that day who didn't see anything. There were many people who 
physically were there, but they didn't see the majesty of heaven. Showers of grace and forgiveness were falling on Calvary. And people were not noticing. Only one person noticed. How come? You just told me that there were three crosses on Calvary. These were the crosses of rebellion, the cross of repentance, and the cross of Jesus, the cross of redemption. Those who are clamoring around the cross of rebellion or hanging on, the, on that cross didn't see anything. They didn't feel the showers of blessings. They didn't feel uh, the showers of forgiveness. They didn't see the love and, and mercy of God there. They saw a helpless person and that's it. Only the person that climbed the cross of repentance was able to see Jesus for who he was. And friends, this is why people may warm the pews of churches and may worship, worship Jesus and yet never experience the power of forgiveness, the secret of Calvary. And this is why they never give it to other people back. Because they've never climbed, they've never been on the cross of repentance. The only place from which you can see the cross of redemption is if, if you get nailed on the cross of repentance. Jesus repeated this spiritual truth several times in his ministry to his disciples. In Matthew chapter 16, he says, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And when you decide to deny yourself, to take your cross and to follow Jesus, ultimately you are going to come with Jesus to Calvary where Jesus is going to ask you to crucify some things in your life and to hang on the cross of repentance not because he does not like you or because he wants you to feel miserable but because this is the only vantage point of Calvary from which you can see the cross of redemption the Bible tells us that God gives grace to the good and the bad but only those who come on the, uh, on the cross of repentance realize that the gifts of forgiveness, of God's goodness that He is showering us with, are actually designed to lead us to the cross of redemption. Because if you clamor around the cross of rebellion, you're only going to be disappointed with Jesus because Jesus is going to disappoint you because you're always going to have the expectations that he is not going to fulfill. And when he disappoints you, people who clamor around the cross of rebellion are going to crucify him over and over and over again and will heap ridicule on him till they break him. Only those who have come to the cross of repentance see Jesus for who he is and then they are transformed through the power of forgiveness into people who have a testimony to share with others and also they realize that they are forgiven in order to give other people forgiveness so that they will enable others to spread the testimony of the power of the cross only eternity will show us one day how many people have not made it there because of you? Because you've refused to give them the power of forgiveness. Would you please grab with me your connection card? Let's turn it to the back. And let's uh, make at least one of these uh, three action steps as our own step into the battle of forgiveness. First, faith in God is not measured by how much one knows 
but by how much he or she loves. Second, like Jesus, I want to surrender my right to hurt those who hurt me so that God's grace can transform them and heal me. And finally, Lord, keep on reminding me that I'm forgiven in order to forgive. May God bless you in your decision making and in growing in forgiveness. stand for the closing hymn, I'm asking all of our choir members, Bill, all of you come up so we can sing the second and third stanzas together for them. Muncie, Mead, Kathy, all of you come up. Everyone stand, please. <coughs> The dying king rejoice to see the fountain in his day. And there my eye through violence he wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins two stanzas for you. Come on, guys.
Heavenly Father, here we are, coming with our wounds to yours, so that we be healed. And oftentimes, in our desperate desire to find healing, we cannot even grasp that we are never going to be healed until we also return forgiveness to others who desperately need it. Would you please give us the strength to not just ask for forgiveness, but to learn from you how to also give it further. Transform us and help us to be a messengers of a new testimony for your grace and mercy to save. In the name of your son Jesus, all the people of God said, Amen. Amen.